hello everyone and thank uh, to the organizers to have accepted this presentation about the registered reports in archaeology. I thought a uh, useware specialist as part of the experimental world of archaeologists could clearly be a leader in this way. And that's why we are today here with uh, Chris Chambers. So uh, let us introduce ourselves, even if uh, Ivan already did. So I'm an engineer. I'm a CNRS engineer in the Passea Laboratory. I'm a specialist of archaeometry, mainly uh, non analytic yeah. interaction of uh, lithic materials. Sorry. Uh, and, um, and I'm the founder of Peer Community in Archaeology, and I'm also a user of confocal microscopy. That's why uh, I was uh, invited here in the first step. But uh, finally, I want to discuss uh, our applications of confocal microscopy. If you're interested in that, you can, you can look at the link at the bottom of the, of the slide. You can see what, what we've done so far. Chris? Yes, and yes, hello. Uh, thank you for having me. So I'm Chris Chambers. I'm a a neuroscientist from Cardiff University. I have no knowledge of archaeology whatsoever. So this has been a very interesting series of talks for me so far. Um, I co-founded the Registered Reports Initiative um, about eight years ago now. I edit the format of a number of journals and uh, I've, I've been involved in a number of initiatives to, to push it forward. And we'll be hearing more about that in today's talk. Thank you. So now uh, let's explain what our register reports. So basically it's uh, another way of organizing the peer review process with two stages of peer review. A first, the first stage before collecting and analyzing the data and another stage after the report or the paper is written as a classic peer review system would do. So stage one, the peer review scrutinizes the introduction, the proposed methods, the proposed analysis, analysis and the pilot data if available. If this round of peer review is positive, the journal offers an imprecisible acceptance regardless of the study outcome. At this stage then, reviewers assess importance of research questions and rigor of the methodology. Next, the author do the research itself and submit to the same pool of reviewers the final product of their work as they would do in a classic system. The introduction and the methods are supposed to be unchanged. The results and discussion are, of course, new parts of the manuscript, and all data and materials are deposited on public archive. The second round of peer review takes place, and if positive, the manuscript is published. During this second round of review, reviewers assess the compliance of the manuscript with the already accepted protocol, and they also check if the discussion and conclusion are evidence-based. So you might be wondering why we do this. Why do we split the review process in this way? And it's for three main reasons. The first is reproducibility. We find that registered reports, because they're pre-specified and reviewed before um, results exist, um, they often contain very detailed and reproducible methods because reviewers are really scrutinizing them in a lot of detail. Uh, and they tend to be larger studies as well. Um, when uh, we pre-plan our sample sizes for, for research without um, having results in hand, um, we often need to, to recruit or to acquire more data than we otherwise would. So we find these studies tend to be larger. They're also more transparent in a couple of ways. One, as mentioned, they're usually accompanied by open data and open materials, digital materials but also they're transparent in another way, which is that in the reporting of the results of a registered report, there's a clear distinction between outcomes that were pre-planned and pre-specified according to an analytic plan that is fixed, but also exploratory outcomes, which were not pre-registered and were decided based upon um, observation of the data after the fact. And the third main benefit or category of benefit is credibility. So this initiative was created to fundamentally to eliminate different forms of bias in the publishing process. Because the decision to publish or not is made prior to the knowledge of results, it's not possible for the outcomes of the research to influence the editorial decision. So it's the only initiative which eliminates publication bias against certain kinds of results. It eliminates hindsight bias or reinventing history. And it also um, eliminates various forms of selective reporting by researchers in order to accentuate the positive or to add spin to their findings. 
Next slide. So that because of this, none of these things matter. So um, all of us have probably had an experience at a peer reviewed journal where um, we've had an article rejected, perhaps because a hypothesis was unsupported, or perhaps where we did inferential statistics, um, we obtained non-significant results, or perhaps because editors and reviewers felt that the results we presented weren't sufficiently novel or compelling or impactful. None of these criteria matter with a registered report because the results are taken out of the evaluation. The philosophy underlying this is that in assessing scientific quality, it's important to put aside results as much as possible because the results um, can only bias us in certain ways and distort the literature. We should be assessing science independently of the results. The history of this initiative, and you can unpack this slide, please, there's a couple of other elements to it. Um, it is from the 1960s, in fact, in psychology. And, and the, the history of pre-registration and pre-specification goes back much further. But just briefly, I mean, this idea has been floating around now for about 50 years in different forms, in psychology, in the social sciences, and in medicine, of course, where it led to the advent of clinical trial registration. But it wasn't until um, now, uh, next slide, please, um, that we've seen the growth of registered reports really since 2013 when we launched at the journal Cortex, which is a neuroscience journal, at which I'm an editor. And we've seen the steady growth of the, of the format across a range of fields, psychology, neuroscience, political science, ecology, um, medicine, um, and various other sciences, all the way through up until 2019 and 2020, of course, with the advent of the pandemic, we've seen the initiative also launch to help address um, uh, uh, the challenges of COVID-19, in particular, um, ensuring that we get a reproducible and reliable corpus of knowledge um, uh, addressing different aspects of the pandemic. But uh, what about uh, registered reports in archaeology? First, uh, let me tell me one important thing. Probably not all archaeological studies could fit with the registered report system. Or maybe they could. We have to think about it. So let's take some examples. I try to sort cases, but I'm not ultra sure that my sorting is perfect. For example, my guess is uh, that it would be quite difficult to use registered reports, uh, a registered report process for the description of a new taxa of rodent discovered in a Pleistocene site, since the authors do not know before finding it that they were even looking for it. But on the contrary, an experimental study like the one presented on the right that you may know could clearly use the registered report system. The protocol is established way before the experiment and could lead to a first stage of peer review. And later, after the sheeps have completed the experiment, the teeth microarray study could begin. The measurement with the confocal microscope be done, the statistics calculated, etc. Here is another example of what I think could and couldn't be done by using registered report system. I guess they did not expect to find a new hominid species when they submitted this fragment of phalanx to a ancient DNA study, though they could not have submitted the protocol before making the discovery. But on the other hand, other types of ancient DNA papers could clearly make use of a registered report process. Same here, I guess these two kinds of lytic studies are not as likely to use registered reports. I get the one on the right will be easier, don't you? So let's take a figure some of you may know. If I, try, if I try to resume it, this is what would happen with a registered report process for such studies. I think that our community present today is really not far from this and could lead the way in this direction. So maybe now you're sufficiently convinced by your arguments, but wait, after this presentation, where can you submit a manuscript for such a process? in Bulletin de la Société Préhistorique Française, in GAS, in PLOS One, I guess not. But here we are, Chris will present you the peer community in registered reports. Yes, yeah, so the, the peer community in registered reports is an initiative that we launched earlier this year, and it's a branch of the broader PCI initiative focused entirely on reviewing and recommending registered reports preprints across all sciences, um, social sciences and humanities, therefore including archaeology. And the idea here is that rather than submitting a registered report to a peer-reviewed journal, you submit to the PCI initiative, obtain expert reviews and expert handling of, of the manuscript. And then if the review process is positive, 
um, PCI registered reports issues an acceptance, which you can then port to a range of journals um, which have committed to accepting our editorial decisions without further peer review. So our peer review process replaces that of a number of journals. And this is how it looks just briefly. I won't go into a lot of detail here. I know we're pressed for time, but essentially in the top row there, you can see the, the initial stage where you submit a stage one registered report, which is peer reviewed and then revised. It can then um, be recommended, which is the PCI term for an, an acceptance, um, at which point um, authors go away and conduct their study um, their in principle acceptance before results are in. And then when they're finished, they return and they deposit an updated preprint on the preprint server which goes through stage two review. And again, it's assessed by recommenders and reviewers and if assessed favorably is awarded a recommend recommendation. This recommendation remains completely open as are the reviews and it's a final citable product. Um, and it's that sufficient in fact for the science, all the science has been done, but if the authors wish for career reasons or any other reason, they can port their, um, their preprint to a, any peer review journal that they wish. And there's a list of PCI registered reports friendly journals, as I say, which have committed to accepting the recommendations of PCI RR without further peer review. And there's currently 23 of these PCI registered reports friendly journals. Um, and if you just hit a key there, um, I can show you there's four, I think, which would be relevant for archaeology at the moment. This initiative began life in um, in areas where registered reports are more dominant at the moment. So there aren't any specialist archaeology journals at the moment on our list, but there are four generalist journals which will publish archaeology research at the moment, um, including a Royal Society journal where I'm an editor, Royal Society Open Science. So these journals have committed to accepting the recommendations of PCI registered reports without further review. Um, and, you know, I want to emphasize that we really welcome um, archaeologists joining PCI registered reports, contribute your expertise to the community. And, and if you're an editor at an archaeology journal, we also welcome you joining as PCI RR friendly so that we can um, bring together experts and expertise across many different fields, take back control of the peer review process from corporate publishers and ensure we have an open and rigorous scientific record. There's two other features I want to also note about PCI registered reports. One is called programmatic RRs, which are an initiative in which one stage one manuscript or protocol can produce multiple stage two outputs. So you can imagine a program of work that you might have in mind to test a range of different hypotheses, for instance, as part of a PhD studentship or a fellowship or any other kind of project you have in mind. This can then, once it achieves in principle acceptance, lead to multiple stage two outputs. So it can be incredibly efficient as a way of doing science. And the second um, uh, uh, feature I can emphasize which is unique to PCI reports is called scheduled review. Uh, we know that the peer review process at many journals can be slow. And one of the solutions we've devised to this, um, which is particularly important for registered reports, is to schedule the review in advance. So rather than submitting a full stage one manuscript initially, what authors instead do, as shown in panel B of this, of this schematic, is they prepare a registered report snapshot, which is a one page protocol summary before they've even started writing their full manuscript. Based upon this snapshot, we then recruit um, reviewers in advance for perhaps six to eight to 10 weeks ahead into the future. We set in dates at which they've committed to performing a, an in-depth review of a full manuscript. During that time, the authors prepare their full manuscript, submit it on the assigned date. It's then reviewed in a matter of days. Um, so it can reduce the review process time right down from you know, weeks and months, right down to a matter of maybe four to five days. So I won't spend much time on this due to time, but just to, just to emphasize some of the benefits of registered reports compared to non-registered reports, which is the, uh, the, the left crosses there, um, a regular non-registered report article at a traditional journal really offers none of these features on the left here, whether it's in principle acceptance before results, programmatic registered reports, peer review undertaken independently of any journal, et cetera. At a, uh, at a traditional journal, registered reports are better. They offer um, pre-study evaluation and also acceptance regardless of outcomes. But PCI registered reports really captures all of these um, it, it, in a way that no other initiative does. So it offers, as I say, these unique initiatives of programmatic registered reports and scheduled review. We also have a rigorous e examination process for new recommenders, which tests knowledge of the registered reports process and it ensures high editorial standards. And the fact that the review 
process is undertaken by PCI rather than a journal gives authors much more power to decide the fate of their research. Rather than being tied to one journal and going from journal to journal, why not centralize the review process, take back control of that by the academic community, and then we decide our destinations journals ourselves and returns power to us. So let's just resume this as a promoting open science and following the sentence by John Tennant, open science is just good science. And uh, let's resume what we need for open science. We need it to be free, to be peer reviewed here twice. We need to be open and reproducible. All of this is true with peer community in and especially for the two stage peer review with uh, PCR or register reports. So let me now thank you for your attention. And uh, you can find these slides uh, on the OSF uh, repository, and you can find us on in our website or Twitter account. <laughs>